slides. Um, I think, guys, uh, the intent of this is to make sure that this is um, a, an interactive session. So if you've got questions and so on, please ask. Um, there is a recording of the session being delivered. So if you just want to watch it being delivered, to me, that's the better one to watch. This is really a trainer trainer scenario, which means I can walk through the content. Um, but really, if that's not going to help you much, um, I need to know what your questions are and make sure that you get all of those answered. So I want to make sure we focus on you guys getting what you need out of it, uh, as opposed to me just presenting the content, which is already available as a recording. Okay, so please unmute yourself, ask questions, um, put them in the IM window, whatever's going on there. Um, I'll bring the slides up um, to one side of the screen and I'll keep the IM window open on the other side so we can see what's going on. Uh, let me just resize this a little bit. If we bring that up over here, okay. All right, let me get this as big as we possibly can. Is everyone, could I just ask quickly, can everyone see the slides now? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So the hybrid identity part of um, the enterprise mobility story is really focused around um, three things. It's focused around our on-premise identity scenarios, which are Active Directory, Identity Manager, um, and, and ADFS, and then the bridges out to um, the cloud in terms of sync and federation, and then um, Azure Active Directory being our um, identity and access management for the cloud. And so this, the, the content that you see on the way through is how do we bring all of those things together? Um, we want our customers to bridge out from their existing investment out to the cloud, whether that is through an on-premise an on identity management bridging out, whether that is a direct to cloud, or whether that is, in most cases, a, um, a, a hybrid scenario of both coming together. So um, we start off, hopefully most of you guys have seen these slides before in terms of the, the people-centric IT setup around um, the users changed. And the storyline I have here is we've moved through a series of technology um, iterations from the mainframe green screen through the server client scenario where everyone was physically at a desk through the, um, the, the laptop range where remote access became the big problem. We've now moved into the next generation, which is mobility, where the form factor has changed, but also the always on um, connection has, has come along. Along with that comes the explosion of devices in terms of different platforms, iOS, Android, and Windows, as well as different form factors in terms of they're not just desktops and laptops, but they're touch first. They are tablets, they're phablets, they're phones. Um, and really what this has done is eroded what used to be a standards-based approach to corporate IT. No longer is it guaranteed that you know what's on the device. Do no longer are you an admin on the device. So what happens when you bring the applications and the data onto those devices? How do you get it on? How do you manage it when it's in place? And how do you get it back off again um, in the event that something goes horribly wrong? And so the, our approach to all of this is to to bring it all together um, and wrap management, access control, and information protection around all of those things. Um, through the enablement of users, the protection of that data, and then the unification of the environment, both in terms of the device management aspect, in terms of configuration manager and Intune, but also from an identity point of view, bringing Active Directory and Azure Active Directory together. Um, and so all of that setup basically um, comes together under the people-centric IT. Um, the empowering enterprise mobility. Um, it, you'll see enterprise mobility and pe people-centric IT kind of both being used at the moment. We're, we're working out um, what our top line is. At the moment, the uh, official phraseology is that we enable enterprise mobility through people-centric IT approach, um, but you should see some rationalization there. You will see both uh, at the moment. There is just a setup slide in terms of um, the raw capabilities, just a summarization. Uh, we have one of these in each set of content that is available, not just for um, this series in terms of EMS, but also all of our content that's on Infopedia. There's always a setup slide that just summarizes what it is we're about 
And if nothing else, these are like the top five to ten points that we want to make sure that you get across. And even if you only get this far in the conversation, these are the things that are like, here's your elevator pitch, basically, to make sure that those get across. All right, we start by going through the unification side. Um, this is the creation of a centralized identity on-premise and then the bridging out uh, through the different mechanisms to connect on-prem out to the cloud. We start with just a setup as to, well, why, why do we even care about having a, a single user identity for each user? Why do we even care about a common identity? The reality that we're trying to answer here is, if a user only has one username and one password to remember, uh, two things become apparent. One is uh, the feedback that we've received when we've gone out and talked to people about this is that they're willing to take a, a more difficult password and, and a higher level of validation when they only have to remember one thing and not multiple things. Uh, second of all, it's, uh, it prevents the user from having to manage passwords, basically, um, and, and manage multiple passwords, and they start doing silly things like writing them down or using the same, same password everywhere and things like that use the same, you log on in the same password everywhere and then apply additional levels of validation uh, such as um, you know, multi-factor authentication or additional strong controls like device registration. Um, that is really where uh, we want to get people to and that's why we're focusing on that both on-prem in terms of accessing files, apps, web apps and so on, but also out to things like Office 365 and Windows Intune, which are our first party applications on Azure Active Directory. I'm sure you guys are all aware that they sit on top of Azure AD and then out to SaaS applications as well, which uh, I was looking at the gallery yesterday and we're up to like 1,380, I think, applications sitting out there now. So more and more investment being made in the SaaS application space. On-premise, uh, we do this. Uh, these slides haven't been updated uh, to reflect the new name, but uh, moving forward, it's just Identity Manager. The forefront brand is dead. Uh, it's been removed. Uh, for those of you that didn't see the note, the roadmap slides are now on Infopedia, and uh, we will have a public blog post next Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever the 23rd is. 23rd is Wednesday. Uh, next Wednesday, there'll be a public blog go out that just outlines, yes, this is the new name, these are the top level investments we're making, uh, and this is the timeline uh, in terms of when the next version will be delivered. For now, we will keep uh, referring to the existing version as Forefront Identity Manager. That does the on-prem uh, identity management, bringing everything together, doing synchronization, providing self-service, password reset, group management, and so on um, for, uh, for on-premises locations. You'll notice down the bottom that we start to bring in the different identity attributes in terms of um, multiple repositories. And this is important going forward because we do this not only on-premise, but as you'll see, we're also doing direct to Azure AD synchronization of those as well. Um, which brings in an interesting scenario around the, the, the kind of focus for Azure, uh, for Active Directory on-prem, but then, you know, kind of, um, a devaluation, which sounds like a very strong word, and I don't mean it that strong, but we are starting to bypass on-premise Active Directory and going straight to Azure Active Directory. Um, and I think that we're, we're starting down a journey where, A, we're going to get a lot of questions about that, but B, um, we need to be aware that you know we are taking our customers direct from the AD that they have straight out to Azure Active Directory as well, which we'll see just in a minute. A few, uh, some slides around... Um, the different connection models, I'm sure that a lot of people on this call will be aware, but there are three different identity models that really exist uh, in our world. The first is cloud only. Uh, that's where you're only like an Office 365 user. You don't have an on-premise Active Directory. We don't focus too much on that in this space. The um, uh, synchronization, which is where we'll do identity sync with or without password hash. Uh, when you synchronize the password hash, you can authenticate at either end because the password is stored in both ends. And so either on-prem Windows Server can authenticate you or uh, Azure Active Directory can authenticate you. We will have right back um, of attributes, users, devices, passwords, and groups um, that will be coming soon through the new Azure AD sync tool that will light up over a period of time. The first preview is going to come out uh, this week. 
and over the next few months um, all of those capabilities will come to light initially we're focused on a small set of capabilities for azure ad sync uh, by the time we get to july uh, we'll be able to fully um, deploy and be able to actually implement the azure active directory premium capabilities so there are things in azure ad premium today that uh, if a customer wants to adopt them against an on-prem environment they simply won't work yet um, they will over the next few months and so at the moment tell a great story from a deployment point of view uh, take a look and to see what's actually possible uh, particularly between now and the end of June from a federation point of view uh, this is where we continue to do the identity sync without the password or even with the password but then uh, triggering the on-premise authentication back down this allows customers who either don't want to synchronize passwords to the cloud or uh, just simply want all authentication to come back against their Active Directory to be able to do that. Uh, they can do it with ADFS, and of course there are third-party options out there as well that will do that same brokering. Um, that is also, uh, you know, things like workplace join and multi-factor authentication uh, are functions of, of ADFS when it comes to authentication back on-prem. So therefore, you can bring in those additional levels of validation. You can set rules uh, around things like Office 365 and require device registration, require multi-factor authentication, require only on-prem resources to be able to access Office 365. All those kind of permutations are possible uh, using the rules of, of ADFS. Just some details in deep uh, around the identity federation itself. Uh, not only of the scenarios we just talked about, but also out to SaaS applications in the cloud, and then uh, the B2B scenarios as well. Uh, not something we see a lot of, but it's something that people ask about, so we include it here. ADFS has had a lot of investment in, uh, in 2012 R2 to be able to uh, be easier to deploy, easier to manage. Um, it, it is far more um, far more simple. That's not really good English, but uh, it's much easier to deploy. It's much easier to configure, bringing in multi-factor authentication, bringing in device registration, uh, and then uh, the connections out to the SaaS apps is through Azure Active Directory. This is really a slide about the new uh, Identity Sync Engine, uh, Azure Active Directory Sync as its name shall be. This allows us to take uh, LDAP v3 databases, uh, with, uh, web service connections through SOAP, Java and REST, Azure uh, Active Directory itself, anything that PowerShell can talk to, so CSV files and that kind of thing, and then generic SQL through ODBC connections, and synchronize that directly out to Azure Active Directory. Uh, this overcomes customers who either don't have an AD or it's not their primary or they've got additional levels uh, of uh, or directories in their environment and want to have them all synchronized out to Azure Active Directory for O365 or SaaS application uh, access. And so uh, this will come out over the next few um, things. Uh, Michael, are flat files supported? If you can talk to that flat file using one of the things that are on the list, then the answer is yes. Uh, Azure Active Directory, you know, there's some, uh, some obviously some animations going on this slide, but really we want we need to position Azure Active Directory as our uh, identity and access management solution for the cloud. It brings in a number of attributes around uh, users and groups, uh, part self-service password reset. We will have device registration in the cloud in the very near future. Uh, look for that in a couple of months' time. We will have, uh, we already have security reports and so on there where we can see anomalous uh, behavior in terms of users logging on in multiple locations in a time frame that's not possible. Things like uh, users using anonymizers, uh, people logging on with a device that they typically do, don't log on to. Uh, and so bringing that all together and, and looking for pattern recognition uh, using the machine learning that we have in the in the Azure platform allows us to uh, to do some pretty cool stuff from a reporting point of view. Um, and that applies to anything that authenticates against Azure Active Directory. So just logging onto Office 365, you can really start to see some patterns. Uh, maybe I log on with an iPad every day, and then all of a sudden I log on with an Android device. That will flag um, 
uh, uh, a report in terms of, hey, Bob's normally using an iPad and he's suddenly using an Android. You might want to check that he hasn't switched devices or someone's got his password and is doing something a bit odd. Um, there's a lot of machine learning that we do to search for those patterns. Azure Active Directory Premium is the licensing SKU that brings in those upper level uh, capabilities. I think there's a slide in here uh, a little bit later that, that differentiates between the two. Uh, SLA, use rights to identity manager on-prem. Um, the way that that works is by being a subscriber to Azure Active Directory Premium, you get unlimited rights to identity manager server uh, on-prem, so fill your boots. And then you get one identity manager cal for each um, user that is a subscriber. Uh, so basically, it's a one to one mapping. So, deploy identity manager server. So, anything that you can do with identity manager server in isolation, which pretty much boils down to sync, uh, you can have your filly boots. And then the cal situation is a one for one uh, provision there so that people can do that on prem should they need to. A little bit more uh, filling out around the Azure Active Directory. Obviously, we talked about the coming soon and, and synchronizing things up, um, connecting up. I think there's a little bit of duplication in the way these slides have been put together. You could probably choose to, to drop some of these. They are a little bit duplicative. Uh, that one's carrying on as well. SAS apps we're going to touch on. It says 1,200. We're up uh, 1,379, I think, was the number yesterday. So it's continuing to grow every day uh, as we get more and more in there bringing the identities in. You can connect to not only the SaaS apps that are in the gallery, but you can also uh, redirect to your own custom line of business apps, so long as you expose some sort of interface for us to be able to talk to, bring your own uh, line of business apps in there. And then from the console, we were talking about um, being able to see all the users and so on. Uh, if, if there's interest, I'll bring up one of our uh, Azure Active Directory premium tenants, so you can see the back end uh, to see what that looks like if anyone's interested in that. Uh, do the cows extend to FIM CM as they currently do from here? Yes. So basically, it is um, FIM licensing as it is today. Um, basically, when you're an Azure Active Directory subscriber, um, as soon as you become a subscriber to AAD Premium, you get unlimited rights to deploy FIM server. And then for each user that has a license in the Azure AD Premium subscription, you get a FIM cow as it is today. Um, the only thing that's not included in that is um, uh, the external connector. Um, so if you're doing the external connector, uh, then you still need to buy that separately. Uh, Robert, SA is irrelevant in this model because it's a subscription. Yeah, I, I realize you're talking about FIM. So you get rights to use FIM on-prem. So long as you maintain um, your subscription to Azure AD Premium, you can use the on-premise version, whatever that is. As soon as you stop your subscription, you either must buy the licenses that you were granted access to um, out, or uh, you need to uninstall it. Standard uh, on-premise uh, rights that we grant to subscriptions. This is the same model for Intune with Config. It's the same model for Azure Rights Management with on-prem rights management. Um, so basically, what we're saying is anyone who subscribes to our cloud services gets rights to the on-premise versions. And that's pretty consistent across everything that we're doing now. Uh, security features, we talked about the anomalous activity. As I say, if something anyone wants to see it, we can bring up the, that console at the end and show you what those look like. All right, the breakdown between free and premium offerings. Um, as you can see at the top, the, direct, the Azure Active Directory directory itself. In free, you can have up to 500,000 objects. and at premium, there's no limit. Um, the single sign-on to SaaS apps, you get 10 for free, but after that, you've got to pay. Um, and then the differences really come in in those upper-level functions around uh, group management, self-service password reset, um, and then the security reports, the usage reporting, branding, uh, and being able to put your own logos and colors and all that kind of stuff on there. Um, and multi-factor authentication comes into that as well. SLA comes with premium, and then uh, the rights to on-premise uh, identity manager, um, Cal Plus server is there as well. So all of this content is, is published both in the EMS content and, and here as well for, for completeness. All right. End user experiences, we really focus on self-service and single sign-on. 
from a self-service point of view, um, on-premise, we look at Identity Manager in the group management. For Microsoft employees, this is IDWeb, uh, that is FIM. Uh, the ability to update your profile details and update missing information, resetting your own password, um, delegating down the rights to onboard new users and have them all set up correctly, uh, and then being able to uh, update and change that with policy. So you can set rules around who needs to approve, uh, how that approval routing works, and all that kind of thing. Is the object limit a hard technical limit or an honor system limit? Uh, that's a really good question. I actually don't know the answer to that one. I would need to uh, check in with the engineering team whether there is a technical limit. I don't believe that there is a hard technical blocker, um, but uh, I think what will happen is it will turn up on an exception report. But there may well be a technical limit that says if premium is not enabled, then stop. Uh, I would need to check into that, Paul. Good question. No, I should know the answer to that. From a cloud point of view, very similar capabilities delivered from Azure Active Directory. Um, Self-service password reset is there that will write back as we have all the synchronization engines in place, the ability to update your profile through the myapps.microsoft.com portal, um, managing access requests. You can create your own groups and say whether you want to approve access to that and all that kind of thing. Um, the SaaS application gallery that we talked about, logging on with your single corporate credentials, um, and then the connection back down to uh, on-prem as well, being able to leverage what you already have. From a single sign-on point of view, uh, in terms of what you get, you get all of your resources in one place. Um, you get to leverage your existing investments, all of those different directories that we talked about, the different applications that you have on-prem, the connections up to the cloud, to SaaS apps, to our first party Office 365, Windows Intune, and so on. So being able to bring those all together um, and really say to a customer, here's what your users are going to be able to do. Log on once with one set of credentials, MFA and additional levels may, may uh, be enforced, but ultimately at this point in time, uh, they can sign on just with that single set of credentials and be able to get access to everything that that they need to get access to. Uh, the obligatory uh, logo slide, there's just a, a bunch of uh, ones that have been put together and, uh, to give an example of what's there. Obviously up over 1300 now, um, we can't put them all on there, but um, it is there nonetheless. All right, protecting data. Active Directory itself, uh, this slide's been around for a while, but this is basically the investments in Active Directory in terms of being able to run at scale, being able to run virtualized, domain controller cloning, these are all just standard 2012 and above capabilities that we have, the PowerShell improvements, the improved deployment experience in terms of instead of having to RDS into machines and run a plethora of tools, uh, you can now do it all from a single console remotely, which is great, uh, bringing in ADFS and, uh, and the cloud platform being able to uh, develop as well is still a key one, having on-premise and other applications uh, authenticate against Active Directory. And then the activation, uh, which everyone forgets about, uh, by virtue of joining the domain, you can activate Office and Windows, uh, which is kind of cool. Multi-factor authentication, I would say most people in this call get the uh, concept of multi-factor auth, the uh, ability to require that additional level of validation. From a Microsoft point of view, this is uh, Azure multi-factor authentication. Uh, this is the phone factor acquisition that we did. So that's bringing it down to phone calls, to text messages, to mobile applications, challenging the user to prove that they are who they say they are before they get access to something. Uh, and if you think about a username and a password, plus the ability to answer a phone and enter a PIN code, it's getting harder and harder for someone to be able to social engineer that out because I managed to get your username and password, I managed to get a hold of your phone or clone it, uh, I knew your PIN code and I was able to answer the challenge on demand um, to be able to authenticate. So it, it just gets it to a point where you can satisfactorily feel that you've authenticated the user and verified the identity before you allow them to go through. Uh, a little bit on Azure Multi-Factor Auth versus O365 MFA. Um, we do give, for all of the services, a number of features to Office 365 for MFA, for Azure AD, uh, and 
uh, in uh, in the full service, you get the custom greetings, the fraud alert, the SDK access, security reports again, uh, the ability to use MFA on-premise, there's a bypass mechanism, the ability to block and unblock users, you can use uh, customizable caller ID, and also uh, you can do event confirmations and reporting as well. So uh, there is a, quite a bit more in the full service that's not provided to Office 365, which is always a common question. Uh, we've moved Active Directory Rights Management out to the cloud with Azure Rights Management. Uh, they are different services uh, and they don't particularly coexist that well. We're working on that. Um, there are hybrid options in terms of bringing the service back down on-prem uh, and, and connecting down depending on whether you want to run on-prem or whether you want to consume a cloud service. We have connectors that connect to uh, SharePoint and Exchange. Uh, as well as the file servers. So uh, from a deployment point of view, installing a connector on-prem is all you have to do, and then this, the uh, web service does the rest. The connectors make the on-premise environment look like they've got AD RMS. Uh, that's basically how they work. So uh, applications and so on think they're talking to AD RMS, uh, but at the back it's uh, shuffling off to the rights management service and, and backwards and forwards. It makes it much easier to securely share documents when you move to Azure RMS because it's external uh, and because it's a web server, it means we can go out to multiple platforms in terms of iOS, Android and so on. We've got a lot of application developers bringing RMS capability into their apps. Uh, we've already got PDF support with Foxit and Adobe's on the way as well and we continue to work with, with lots of other application providers so that we can move to a model of any application with any document type on any platform and it all just works. Uh, that's the goal that we have and that's the path that we're on uh, right now. And then easy integration of course uh, when you install the, the client the, it integrates with the Windows shell, it integrates with Office and so on, uh, and making it nice and easy to be able to uh, uh, to protect that data and then be able to share it as well. Governance and compliance, which is uh, Identity Manager again, bringing in the ability to, to manage access based on roles, the segregation of duties, making sure that people can't do multiple things in a process, which would be bad. Um, doing self-service access requests and approvals, performing attestation, being able to prove that things are the way that you say they are, uh, and then being able to demonstrate compliance with organizational policies uh, and regulatory compliance as well. There would normally be a demo there, which unfortunately I can't show you today unless my I can suddenly magically connect to my server, which I will check again, and then we're back to a summary. So, what questions do people have? You guys can come off mute if you want, type it in the window. Nothing? Where do you demo from to show uh, reporting functionality? That's a good question, Mark. Um, so you need an Azure AD Premium subscription, um, and you need to work at making sure that you populate the resorts, uh, resources. Sorry. So let me show you. Just check one moment. I'm just going to bring something up. I will re-share my screen momentarily. Okay, let me know when you can see my screen again. Okay, can someone just confirm you can see my screen? Okay, yes. cool. All right, so 
Sorry, I just needed to do something that required me to unshare my screen for a moment. Um, so in terms of reporting and so on, um, we run multiple Azure um, AD Premium subscriptions against uh, our Contoso demo environments. So contosodemo.com and contosodemo.net. Um, what I'm showing you is uh, the tenant that I'm actually going to use in the TechEd keynote. So uh, what that allows you to do is to come in and see reports from a number of places and so on. You can specify down from the last 24 hours, seven days, 30 days. Um, this is not an easy thing to um, be able to populate and and actually get some good re uh, reports out of. Um, the way that we do this is um, to do it by yourself. You can use the Tor browser network, which does anonymizing. Um, you could set up a number of accounts in an environment and then use the Tor browser and get a new identity, which basically routes your traffic all over the world. Um, and, and basically triggers some pretty dodgy looking behavior in terms of um, accounts. So here you can see we've got some uh, accounts coming through. You see the IP addresses and so on. And they're coming from unknown sources because we're routing them all over the world. Um, we all, You could also have people around the world doing that, which for the keynote I've actually got uh, a whole lot of volunteers who have helped us immensely. Probably some of you are on this call who are logging on with these accounts at different times of the day all over the world. So we're getting some real data in there um, as well as some Tor-based uh, faked data. Um, if we take a look at the multiple geographies one, here you can see we're getting some interesting things in terms of uh, Elise logged on in Austria and then logged on in Romania uh, within two minutes. Yeah, it normally takes two hours to get there. So unlikely that that's able to happen. Um, here's one that went pretty close, Singapore and then Sweden. You know, 10, 10 hours, 55 minutes, it normally takes 11. Might have pulled that one off, maybe, maybe not. Germany and the United States within seven and a half hours, it takes nine hours to get there, these kinds of things. So you can drill in and see what's going on. Um, being able to see IP addresses with suspicious activity, I don't think we're triggering any of that uh, against the backend platform. We're not triggering infective devices. No irregular activity. So, Adam, I mean, you've you've got this where you've got a demo environment. A yep. bunch of us on this call, we're going to end up demoing this, you know, hit and miss over the next six months. Yep. How how would you envision that we'd be able to do this? It's a good question, and and Nazos is I don't know if Nazos is on the call, but um, um. Nazos is looking to set up a number of. No, he's not on the call. Um, Nezos has a number of tenants that have been set up. We don't have an Azure AD Premium um, trial available yet. We will have one. It's just not available yet. Um, right now, this is a hard thing to demo, simply because A, you've got to have an active AD Premium subscription, and B, you've got to start using it to be okay. able to trigger how about How about giving us a deck with some static slides that just kind of show... Yeah, so I think the, the like. things that we're going to work on are um, giving you some screenshots, giving you some videos to be able to use and so on. Um, I think that's the goal. Hey, Adam, this is Jay. Sorry to interrupt, but Randy, hey, Nazos gave us all that, uh, and I can get you access to it. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so I think um, I think that the hard part, or not that hard, the harder part is the data only lasts for 30 days, so you've got to actively keep using the account and keep um, getting people logging on to be able to trigger live data. Otherwise, it expires. So having some screenshots, that would be probably pretty good. Um, by the time we get to the TechEd keynote on May 12, um, we'll have some pretty good data in here that people are going to be able to see, um, which is good. And I think we could probably screenshot that because it's, uh, other than my name, everything is um, LCA approved fake names. But I agree, showing the IT side of Azure AD Premium uh, is, I don't think, going to be an easy thing in the in the foreseeable future. Um, showing the end user experiences, that's why we have Contoso Demo and other things that allow you to do that. Um, but yeah, this side of it's a little more challenging. So you know, I just wanted you to see that's what that looks like. Um, any other questions? I can see who's on this call. You guys are normally pretty chirpy. Is it Friday morning or what? Hey, hey Adam, this is Adnan. Quick question. Um, Here we question go. Asked, asked about the AD RMS and RMS comparison and how it compares with the Azure RMS, which is included with Office 365 E3 SKU. Yep. So 
Um, should we include like a slide which compares all that? Yeah, so um, the differences between AD RMS and Azure RMS uh, are, are simpler in terms of um, we're investing in the mobile platforms and the SDK um, in Azure RMS and that's not on-prem. The O365 RMS and full RMS today, there is very little difference. Um, you know, his, Azure RMS grew up by uh, being in Office 365 first, and now we are starting to grow it out. Today, to be frank, there is very little difference between RMS for O365 and the full RMS service. We are going to, uh, we're just working this through with WWLP and LCA at the moment. I believe there's going to be one checkbox difference between the two uh, right now. The Azure RMS roadmap uh, indicates that this gap will grow over time. Um, we have new capabilities coming in to Azure RMS over the next six months, which will mean that the list difference between the, the O365 and the other one will grow more. So once we have that locked, we will create a table um, and make it available. Okay, thank you. Uh, at what point do we stop using the Forefront brand? So the only thing that is branded Forefront is Identity Manager. Um, it, of all the things that we've talked about, Azure Sync and so on has, has never been part of Forefront. Um, Forefront Identity Manager is the name of the, of the version that is in market. We will drop the Forefront brand from vNext. So you will see FIM uh, being used for the next 15 months. I can't, I can't rebrand an existing product in market. We are rebranding from uh, the next version. Thank you. You can just drop Forefront. I mean, from my point of view, as you'll see, I only say Identity Manager now. I, I don't say Forefront Identity Manager. Um, yeah, that, that's why I ask. Later, it's, not right? a, it's not a requirement, though. You know, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Okay. Yeah, I asked because you, you called it both things during the course of the presentation. Yeah, yeah. and when it, it, it is both, to be honest. You know, Identity Manager is the name of the next version, um, and you'll see that all the branding has changed with new logos and all that kind of stuff. Um, but FIM is the product that's in market, and we're 15 months away from shipping the next version, so it's going to live for a while. Adam, uh, uh, Bob Moore here. Hi. Um, I was traveling uh, in New York and Boston this week, and we were talking with the field um, and the feedback we got it was more around um, describing to customers the use cases that are enabled by this infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of work are you guys doing looking at maybe like uh, external collaboration use case descriptions to help pull the solution into the market? I'm not sure I fully understand the, the question. So. Um, our focus is for, especially hybrid identity, is we look at the end user experiences, which are the outcomes that the customer actually gets, and yeah. then we look at the IT side, which is what you have to do to make it work. Understood. I think it's the the earlier, the first part, which is helps to um, build the business case that our clients then go to their directors, to their customers within their organizations and say, by implementing this infrastructure, we're able to do this. Yeah, and, like and, and so you could take the end user experiences out of the hybrid identity content, and that is what we are delivering. I, I think part of the feedback I'm, I'm trying to give to you is that that is, that is one vector. You're changing the end user experience, you're making it more efficient, um, you're enabling secure um, 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 sharing of data. But there's other use cases, other vectors where you can help to build the value of this. And one of them might be that um, taking all of the users, non-employee users, out of your on-premises Active Directory, housing them in, in Azure Active Directory, and then enabling them to access applications and information in secure ways. And that, that's a, like a common problem that most of the clients we interact with have. And this would bring a solution to that and, probably, and might help to bring the the package along. So I, what I heard though was a restatement of our end user experiences which is a single user identity able to access all resources on-prem and in the cloud. What I heard you say to me was just a restatement of that. I, did, okay. I didn't hear anything different in the outcome which was the user can access everything they want no matter where it is. 
whether it's a SaaS application like salesforce.com, whether it's a SharePoint site in Office 365, a line of business app on-prem, the outcome is that the user can I, sign on to all of those. Yeah. So I guess my point is that the, the context, um, applying that, those capabilities in different contexts. Yeah, so to me, that's a use case scenario. It's not what, what I focus on, which is the end user outcomes in deliberately the most generic way possible so that it can get picked up and used in examples. And I think that's the difference between what I focus on and what you guys focus on, which is my role is to tell you, here's the end states we can achieve. Your role is to work with your customers and say, what are the valid scenarios for customer X that this applies to? Because like the scenario you talked about to me isn't generic enough for me to build into global content. Uh, um, yeah. But I definitely yeah. love the fact that you pick that up and go, I'm going to make that real for my customer set because they're finance customers or they're food customers or government customers or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. I, lo I love the workload aspect to that. I think that's, that, that would be good feedback for Neha um, to look at how do we take this more vanilla version and make it specific for specific customer types. I think that would be a great piece of work for Neha to take a look at. Michael's trying to ask a question and doesn't know how to type it. Why don't you just ask it verbally? <laughs> Come on, Grady, you've got to have a question, man. All right. Yeah, I do, Adam. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you well enough. Come on. Got a few other threads open. <laughs> hey, those those fantastic security reports you were just showing. Yeah. Um, is there any capability for a customer to automate the, uh, uh, the, the, the archiving of that to maybe a blob storage account like we do with the RMS logs where they could download it into their – uh, SIM or maybe a SCOM management pack or, or something like that? That is a great question and it is one that I have open with engineering right now which is how do we get that data out of Cosmos which is where it's coming from into a repository so that we can graphically visualize it like overlay it onto you know power map and things like that um, and also archive it um, I don't have an answer for you but it is one that I literally asked engineering yesterday what is our plan and strategy in this space and when will we be able to do that well it just from from my interaction with customers about RMS and showing that article about how to write it out to blob storage and then just download it however you like, they, that seems to resonate pretty well. So yep. you might want to suggest uh, uh, stealing a page out of their playbook. Yeah, I, I want it even easier than that. You know, I want like an export or some sort of connector where you can just plug into it as a data source. Hey, Enterprise Sync Tool V2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need to. I need one. One thing that I need to find out, and the the under the hood blocker that is not obvious is where this data comes from. And I understand the challenges in getting it out, but uh, I, I agree with you completely. You know, I, I want to be able to do a demo where I take that data and I shove it onto Power Map, and we actually have a nice like globe spinning around that shows Bob tried to log in from these two locations, so you can see where they are on a map, for example. Um, that to me is the kind of stuff we need to be able to do, as well as archive it for historical purposes so we can see trending over time. Yeah. I agree with you completely. I'm pushing on that one myself. Um, when I start talking about the security reports and you know logins from multiple geographies, suspicious IP and, and whatnot, a very common response from my customers is, well, I don't want anyone from Europe logging into my cloud properties. You know, or is there anything on the horizon for geofencing or IP whitelisting, blacklisting, things of that nature? So I think there's there's two aspects to that. Today, you can achieve elements of that with when you use ADFS using rules. Um, the better answer is the geofencing, um, whitelist, blacklisting kind of thing. Um, that is what I would say, I would consider that's a formative thing at the moment, um, but absolutely, again, um, on the radar. Michael raises a good point as well, you know, geofencing for traveling workers. Um, the, there are lots of challenges here, and it needs to be, 
I haven't seen many customers that want to black and white block things. Um, and so I guess one of the challenges we've got is when you, when you turn these things on, how do we make it extensible and fluid enough that it knows, oh, Bob's allowed to travel anywhere, but Joe's not. Um, and so I, I think, again, those are investments that we are and should make. Yeah, so Adam, I want to add something there. So what we are saying in the field is that customers are not really looking to block those traveling workers. What they want is when they go out of prem or any other location, they want to get challenged with a stronger authentication like MFA. So that's what they want. So, so that, those, that, uh, that one you can achieve today with ADFS. Um, you can say, hey, if you're internal to the network, you go straight through. When you're external, you have to do MFA. That one we can achieve today um, if you use ADFS. But I agree it would be nice to be able to enable that without requiring ADFS. Yeah, one question that they now are asking is uh, since ADFS and MFA, it actually works with the on-premise MFA server. Yep. Is there any roadmap to integrate with the cloud service? Because all the new is, capabilities uh, are coming up. Let, let's, let's, let's level set on that one. The ADF when when you turn if you connect to Azure multi-factor authentication, that is the there is the you are always talking to the cloud service. So connect on prem or not, you are always talking to the cloud service. unless you have an old version of Phone Factor uh, which had an on-premise version. That now when you connect to EFA, that is the cloud service. We've got ADFM uh, with the MFA plugin and the uh, the phone factor, sorry, MFA um, on on prem. Every time you do an MFA, that's against the cloud service. Right, but the but the challenge again is if, at the ADFS level, you can control the context, right? So you can. You can trigger MFA based on the application types or any other context information that ADFS processes. You, it cannot trigger uh, that MFA call to a specific application that is in the cloud. You know that that is difficult to accomplish. You see where I'm heading? Sorry, that? and you're breaking, you're breaking up. You're breaking up a little bit. Um, can you repeat the? I didn't quite get what you were trying to achieve. Ian, say um, I give you a scenario. The scenario is. When somebody goes outside, um, I want to trigger a, a phone call. Today, this is done through the on-premise scenario, right? The on-premise MFA server. Um, you cannot use the cloud service for that because cloud service is enabled at the application level, like Office 365. So a very common use case that we get, in fact, we are actually doing a POC at one customer, they want Office 365 services, uh, whenever they are consumed from outside, the person should be receiving a phone call before they uh, before they are allowed to access. But when they are on premise, they shouldn't get a phone call. So this is actually done through uh, the MFA server on premise. We cannot really use the cloud service for this. So the question is, is that coming sure. up near time? I don't understand your point. Like there is on premise Azure MFA server. There, there is no phone call initiated from an on prem scenario. There is a connector that you install, quote unquote server, but it's talking to the cloud service. So I'm not quite understanding which way you're trying to go. Uh, but architecturally, that's the way that it works. Yeah, so it, the way it works is it will, it, the MFA server, which is the agent, which is the old multi-factor, ADFS calls that, and then that's what's used to do the authentication. The, but that doesn't have all the newer rich capabilities that the cloud service has. Like that one doesn't so, have. So, and, and I think this is where I want to reset where you're at. So when you have ADFS and you install the Azure MFA, plugin right mm -hmm. and you say for a SharePoint site I want to enforce MFA just as an example right mm -hmm. that and that is talking to the cloud service there is no on-prem scenario versus cloud scenario 
It's only a cloud scenario that happens to have an on-prem connector that talks to it. Okay. Um, but the, here, yeah, here's so the if, if the point is, if your point is, yeah, so Mark's got a good point. Um, 365, that if it's segregate internal, external, correct. Without ADFS, it can't be done. That is correct. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right, but that's not any, so that's not an on-prem cloud service rich versus not, right? That is Office 365 doesn't offer rules to differentiate between where a client is coming from today. We do that with ADFS when you're in a hybrid mode. So where we are going with that is um, we are putting cloud conditional access policies into Azure, which will mean that we can do them in the cloud or you can do them with ADFS. Now, it's not really going to be internal or external because, quite frankly, if you're hitting the cloud service, you kind of are internal. Um, so it's not going to do that. The internal external is going to be an ADFS scenario, and that kind of makes sense. Yeah, okay. So let, let's... But let's email, I want to make sure that you understand the MFA scenario is the same in both cases. So yeah, I, I understand it's using that service, but the, the appearance of the service to the user is very different. And let's, let's connect offline, I'll show you what I'm talking about, because when you integrate with ADFS, it tells you that, okay, a phone call will be made to your phone, but this doesn't give you the option, doesn't give the user option to pick uh, how they want to do the authentication, compared to if oh, you that, do this with yeah, the cloud so that's a, But that's a, well, so that's a, that's a different scenario. You can, like if you look at Toso Demo, we make the, um, the MFA portal available, mfa.contosademo.com, so the user can choose what their preferred method is. If you're meaning a real-time, hey, we're going to do an MFA call, and I'd like to choose the authentication method in that moment, then no, we don't provide that through ADFS today. And that's an ADFS limitation. Okay. So is that something on the roadmap, or it's not currently in any plan to do that? No, uh, we we have we have the ability for the user to choose, but we're not looking at the real time option to be able to switch between them at the time when they when the call is made. Okay. That's not something that I've seen on the VNext roadmap at all. Okay. Haven't so, that to be honest? That's the first time that I've ever heard anyone even ask for it. Um, so it's kind of it, we haven't seen enough noise on that to generate feedback yeah. all right thank you all right we got one minute left anyone got any other questions we kind of got off down a rat hole on that one but anyway back to hybrid identity everyone's good everyone's gonna go rocket deliver it good awesome well thank you guys uh, hopefully we answered the questions that you had Hopefully we went through uh, what you needed to see. The recording of it being delivered is there as well. Um, this was obviously mainly designed to be a Q&A and make sure that you understand uh, or get get your questions answered. Feel free to flick me a mail or someone uh, something if you need to to make sure that you uh, have your questions answered if you do have them. And um, we'll see how we track on the way through. I think the, the next couple of months are... Um, a little challenging in the terms of uh, the prerequisites coming live, but I think once we get to June, we're going to be in a, in a great spot uh, with the storyline, So, uh, and we'll really be able to show a lot of this stuff working as well as telling a great story. Awesome. Thank you.